Sorry about that. That was um gets up there with the longest one of the longest languages that we've had. So I apologize for you guys for the wait. It's been kind of a roller coaster of a weekend getting everything set up to do the live broadcasts and then our prep for the uh, presentations um, was slightly secondary, so we just experienced a bit of that and I, I do apologize. So I know there's so much good content and so many good sessions going on this weekend. So Get ready to be in my document here. All right. So with that being said, I'd like to welcome everyone to the session. Um, but uh, people joining us here in person and those joining online, um, it's great to see you all here. Um, my name is Spike Katora. I'm a co-founder and uh, vice president and director of product development for Vivo. Chris is the software development lead at Vivo. And um, our company is one of the sponsors of PodCam this year. Um, throughout the weekend, you probably noticed the webcams uh, in all the rooms. And um, these cameras have been streaming all of the PodCam sessions uh, throughout the weekend from the six, six session rooms live to the internet using our live on online broadcasting service. And um, like I said before, we spent the majority of the past couple of days getting set up and um, the logistics involved in getting a broadcast set up for six locations has been uh, significant. So we've had a big time pool on that regard. So the um go back and forth here the transition. Okay, so what is Vivo? Um, Vivo is a self-service line online platform for video broadcasting. Um, the core features, obviously, are the ability to broadcast video on the internet and then to have people view the video that you're broadcasting. We have um, a, a suite of additional value-added features that are targeted to businesses and individuals. And we're going to go through those in more detail. Um, these features enhance the viewer experience. Um, just to give you a bit of background on um, kind of some of the key principles that we developed the company and the product on. Ease of use was always extremely important to us. So um, you'll see that as we go through the presentation. And barring any additional technical difficulties, I want to show you a demo of our site and throw us plugged in this camera at the beginning. I can show you um, how we broadcast and do a presentation. So as I said, the core of our functionality is broadcasting and receiving video. Um, next, we're going to talk about a roadmap of where we're going to go with this talk. So we're going to start out with a bit of history. I'll give you a quick background on myself, and then uh, a quick background on Vivo as a company. Um, to talk about why it makes sense to use live video as opposed to archive video or on-demand video like you might see on YouTube. Um, and there are answers for that that are, it does make sense in a lot of cases, but other situations it doesn't make sense. So we'll go through some of those. And um, later on, we'll open it up to discussion for um, I hear your feedback on situations where live video like, makes sense to use. Um, we'll talk a bit about the uh, technology behind Vivo, um, how our service works kind of behind the scenes. Um, we'll go through the features of our service. And we'll go through some comparable services that you may or may not have heard, uh, services in the online world that make use of live video in one way or another. And then I'd actually like to spend the majority of the time of the Probably won't be as much as I originally planned. This took someone to set up, but I want to make a lot of this uh, presentation interactive and have a lot of Q&A to answer any questions you might have about live video. Um, Chris and I and the rest of the people at our company, we've been living the uh, live video space day in and day out for the past, over the past year. So we'd like to share that information with you. now. Okay, before I get into this tree on me, I just want to say that we feel really fortunate to be in a city like Pittsburgh that um, really has so many outlets and resources um, for individuals that are starting their own companies. We are a startup company. Um, you know, and also communities 
within the technology space, like PodCam, people that are interested in social media and new technology and new internet services. Um, I've lived abroad in, is, you know, in a couple of different cities in the U.S., and it's you know, even cities that are considered technology cities, and it's kind of unique um, amongst the other places I've lived, and I've heard this from lots of other people. Uh, just very, very fortunate to have events like PodCamp in the community that's here. Um, I just wanted to point that out. Okay, so as far as me, um, I'm a Pittsburgh native. I grew up in Pittsburgh. Uh, I study human computer interaction and technical security at CMU. Um, I also work there as a research technologist in the Language Technologies Institute and in the Interactive System Laboratories, where I did some hardware developments and also some uh, projects involving uh, speech recognition. Um, I also worked at Microsoft back in uh, 2001 and 2002 as a technical program manager, or focused especially on uh, user interface design. But, um, I've been involved with computers and technology since I was very young, so it's always been a big part of my life. All right, so next we're going to talk about the history of Vivo. So the history of Vivo, we kind of have a, a two-pronged um, customer base, I'll go into that in a minute, but our overall mission is to provide customers with a secure, private, and customizable environment to share life events with family and friends using online video. Um, when I said we had a two-prong approach, those two prongs, we have one set of our, one version of our product is target, uh, targeted towards consumers, which is uh, individuals, and uh, community groups also. That mission is our focus with this group. Um, our pricing, um, we found with consumers and individuals, people may not be uh, broadcasting events all the time. They might have a couple events per year, for example, if they're doing a wedding or something like that. So we build our pricing model to match that. And in this part of our business, customers purchase credits uh, for our service, which are used as they broadcast their events. So if any of you have used uh, Skype, it's uh, similar. You prepay, you buy a block of credits for Skype, and then you, you, know, you bring up those credits as they go down as you use the service. Yeah, Turnpike is also a good example of this. Any of you have used Easy Pass, you know, you fill up your Easy Pass and then it uh, deducts credits as you use it. So, next we're going to go talk about the business focused version of our service. So, the business targeted version of Vivo. It's also publicly released. I should have mentioned this uh, when I was talking about our consumer model, our consumer version, but we launched that uh, in April of 2009. It was publicly launched, and you can sign up for it now at vivolive.com. We've also launched the business version of our service, although currently it's only been released to a limited, limited group of development partners, specific businesses we're working with closely, um, whereby they're giving us feedback to improve the service. Um, we're able to provide that, those improvements to them quickly because there is a small group of uh, development partners. And we're, you know, we're actively seeking new partners in certain business areas. So if any of you are small or medium-sized business centers, um, even large businesses, I can go through a couple of examples of um, companies in, uh, you know, throughout the size range that we're partnering with. Um, that's something we're focused on at the moment. Um, our current industry focus, we have one industry that we're focusing um, the majority of our research resources on right now, that's the publishing industry. Um, one of the use cases that we've been, um, one of the use cases that we've been doing in that industry is book authors who go on speaking tours after they've released a new book. So we've been working a lot with HarperCollins and they will have an author write a book Oftentimes they go on tour and they kind of get sent to the same, you know, fairly limited list of cities around the United States, which is great if you live in New York or LA or one of the big cities. Pittsburgh does get its share of authors, but not as many as the big cities. Um, but we're trying to extend the reach of people attending those events via online video. So we have a very simple 
plug and play self service um, application that the broadcaster can use, take to the bookstore or wherever they're broadcasting the event, and be up and broadcasting within a few minutes. Um, there's also some emerging trends in this industry with um, the popularity of ebooks. So, in these cases, ebooks are often um, produced, you know, the authors are oftentimes independent. Um, there are publishing organizations that um, produce ebooks, but they're obviously very different than the traditional Harper Collins or Random House uh, businesses because they don't have the printing expenses. Um, and basically, these people, most of their promotion is online. If they do any speaking events publicly, um, it's, it's limited just because of budget concerns. Um, the budgets are usually exponentially smaller than what the traditional publishing houses have. You know, but also the tr traditional publishing houses budgets for marketing have been lowered. So we're trying to provide a low cost uh, marketing tool for businesses that fits um, with their budgets. The pricing, um, in contrast to our consumer, the consumer version of Viva, which is the credit system that I described earlier, the pricing rate for businesses is um, one of two options. For businesses that may not be broadcasting that many events, they could pay at a flat rate uh, per event, which makes sense for people that might want to travel to service or you know, have a limited number of, of uh, events to broadcast. The other option is a monthly subscription base fee, which offers them a better value. I think if they go above three events per month, it's a better value to go with a monthly fee. Um, and this is a, a very similar pricing structure to other business services, software as a service applications that businesses are now using. Um, a few examples are Salesforce.com, WebEx, Zendesk. Um, the uh, average fee for these services varies between $50 to $100 a month. We're in that range. We're, we're still finalizing our uh, final pricing for business model, but the uh, test values that we've been using are within that range. And, um, Another important thing to note here about businesses is, is that that's usually below the level where a mid-level manager, a department manager, needs to get sign off from someone above them. So that's been a key feature, and that's a, uh, something we implemented directly as a result of feedback from businesses. So that makes it much more accessible to the decision makers within the organization. Okay, so a big question that comes up when you start talking about live video online is why, you know, who cares about live video, why not just use um, YouTube? And in some instances, YouTube may be the best service, you know, or another similar on-demand service. A lot of companies or individuals will host um, video that's already been taken and produced on their own site. Um, so there's a couple reasons for that. The main the main overarching reason, though, is when you have the need to interact with someone remotely, there has to be some kind of remote interaction to make the live event make sense. Um, that immediacy and that interaction is kind of the keystone of what makes, um, what would give you a desire to have an event live. Um, there's been an explosion, which this group is very familiar with, an explosion of online services that enable this. Twitter is the obvious example. Um, you know, we have near real-time communication to what's happening, and we we integrate with Twitter and other social network services, particularly those that have a live aspect um, as a value-added feature to our service. So, if we get into the demo section, I can show you how that works in a bit more detail. Um, I did want to give you a, a list of um, particular particular events, particular event types that businesses as well as individuals or consumers are using our service. On the consumer end, it's usually life events, family events, um, events that people would like to share with their friends. Some examples are big ones, weddings, uh, family reunions, graduations, people wanting to share the birth of a new baby, um, people with relatives overseas or across the country. All those are very big use cases that we find uh, majority of our customers using the service for. Also, religious events and services is also big. Um, if there's a particular religious leader, they oftentimes go on tour across the country, so it's an extended reach, again, to cities that they wouldn't be able to go to logistically, Similar, similarly to the, um, the authors. Um, two big um, 
kind of emerging uses that we're looking to tailor our service for. Um, one is citizen journalism. Um, this ties in with Twitter and um, a lot of the other news-related services that independent journalists and also journalists for the big news organizations are increasingly making use of. We'd like to have a tool, our service be a tool that fits the needs of citizen journalists. Um, you know, looking at applications specific to this use case, such as you know, the ability to push your automatically push your events to whatever media sources you are reporting for. So if you're an independent journalist and um, you know you have four specific sites that you're writing for, that you know you want to give them um, instant feedback of the video you're shooting, we're looking, we're developing ways to do that. In regards to businesses and organizations, and also governments, <clears throat> I mentioned corporate training, or sorry, corporate events before. Corporate training is also um, another big use. Businesses spend um, an extremely large amount of money every year sending physical people, trainers, on to uh, locations to train on site. Sometimes that is needed, but many times it isn't, especially if they're just giving a presentation and showing slides, and then doing some uh, question and answer with the present with the audience after. Uh, the fact. Um, another big use is promotions and sales. So as you can see, there, there's a wide range of uses for a live video, online live video service, both on the consumer end and the business end. Um, we, haven't, we haven't jumped into the government uh, category, but we are we are one of the companies bidding on the uh, city of Pittsburgh's RFP that they put out a few months ago to live stream all of the city council meetings and other meetings that the city do. City does. They do this currently on PC and uh, PC TV, um, but it's only broadcast at a certain number of times. Only city of Pittsburgh residents get that. I think it's 90,000 people is their reach. This will let us, let them get the reach to anyone on the internet, and it, it'll let them watch it whenever they want, not just when the event is happening live. Um, with our service, all of our videos. If uh, the broadcaster chooses it to be, they're archived and they can be watched at a later date. Alright, so. <coughs> Alright, we're going to talk a bit now. Sure. What do you mean by make your own archive? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Um, that's actually. That need comes up a lot, so the way our, our service works, um, by default, the event will be archived and placed on our servers because that's where the broadcast is happening from. Um, but we have an option where you can download the video file locally to your machine and then host, upload it to wherever you, you'd like and host it there. We're also, this is uh, still being built, but soon we'll have the option if you have a YouTube account or a Vimeo account, you'll be able to automatically put in your Vimeo or YouTube login and push your video from our service to any of those services. Another thing that we're, is in development with us, you know, say you record a two-hour event, you just want to cut out bits and pieces of it. Um, we're working on some online web-based editing tools that will let you edit your file, um, only put up certain pieces if you'd like. Maybe you'd like to just edit certain pieces and keep those on your site, but push some different pieces than in your YouTube. Um, those are all the things that you'll be able to do when we release our online editing. That is something we're working on right now. And I, yeah, if any of you have any questions or want to get more details on anything I'm saying as we go, please let me know. Is this also integrated with TubeMobile? TubeMobile? Um, TubeMobile, once we, so TubeMobile, if, if you guys um, are familiar with it, it's a service that will let you essentially take one of your source videos, upload it to, what is it, 20 different sites? Yeah, something ridiculous. Yeah, 20 different um, online, or sorry, on demand or archive video sites. YouTube's the biggest one. They have, I think, 20 others that it will push it to all at the same time. And then they also have some tracking. So once your video is uploaded, you can see which, you know, how many people are clicking on it um, and watching it, it within each site, how long they stay on the video. So there's really nice analytics. Um, we've worked, I believe, uh, for each of the sites that they feature, you have to work with their development team, and there's some things that need to happen to, um, to have you added as one of their um, providers. But we, we are, we have made the initial steps of getting a contact with them to explore that, and certainly in the future, we'd love to have at some point. So this is a good segue into our next uh, topic, which is the uh, kind of the breakdown in the live online video market. There are, there are free services and there are paid services. 
Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about that. Um, across the whole space, the free sites all launched first. And they, like all free services like YouTube, um, have massive user bases, millions of people, um, and huge cost for them. So they, like most free sites, have tried to pay for their um, their costs by advertising. Um, most of these sites, because none of them have reached profitability on the advertising, they all have, you know, um, Ustream is probably the biggest example. They have tens of millions, or tens or hundreds, uh, yeah, tens of millions of uh, users broadcasting. And because there's no limit on how long you can broadcast, people are broadcasting things like, you know, their, their puppies that they just had, or people do live casting where they're broadcasting, you know, anything they're doing 24-7. Um, that's a huge financial financial drain on these companies. Um, so that combined with the fact that they're trying to make up for that drain by having um, advertising has been a bad situation for them and for the broadcasters. It's a bad situation for them because they're not making money. And all of these companies have raised venture capital and their, their investors um, are expecting a return. So the result of that is more and more of each event page is being taken up by advertising. Um, I don't have the slide here, but we've done some, some analysis and at times it takes up to 70% of a standard window is taken by advertising. And even worse is at times there'll be a pop-up ad that takes up the whole window, which then the pop-up ad itself may have a video ad playing in it. So that's bad. It's especially bad for businesses that, um, that want to keep control of their branding and their message. So when we developed our service, that was kind of a hole in the marketplace that needed to be filled. Um, a service out there that didn't have those ads and didn't have unwanted content pushed to your video page. Um, so that's, that's the free services. Now what all the companies, not all the companies, but a majority of the companies that pr provide free services within the past year have all launched paid versions of their service. So what they're trying to do here is, is make some profit somewhere. So they've set up paid versions of their service where you won't have the ads, they'll what's called white label version of their product where their branding won't be on there. They won't have the ads, but you're paying for the usage. <clears throat> now the issue that's come up they have such outstanding debt from their from their free services that they're paying off, they're artificially trying to inflate the prices of their paid service to make up for that gap. So what we've done with the service, uh, when we designed our business strategy from customer number one, um, we made a choice to have all of our customers, all of our ongoing customers be paid. We do offer a free trial for our service to let you try it out and do a couple events and see if you like it. We have that completely free. But ongoing uh, our service is a paid service um, for that reason. So we expect we expect some of the big services out there, once their venture capital money runs out, to either go to business or just completely cancel, cancel their free services altogether. So um, let's talk a bit more about some of those points here. Okay, some of the free services out there by name, um, Ustream is uh, Ustream and a company called Livestream used to be called Mogulus, or the market leaders um, as far as user size. They have both offered, they have both launched free services in the past. Within the past year, uh, Ustream launched a free service called Watershed. Mogulus changed its whole company name to a Livestream and they offer a free service as well as a pay service but under the Livestream umbrella. Two other sites, um, there's one called Stickem, and there's another called Kite. Um, Justin TV is out there. Justin TV does not offer a paid service. Um, what they do is they offer you, the viewer, the chance to pay for the privilege of having no ads on their service. So if you'd like to pay just not to be annoyed by ads, you can do that. Whether or not that would be profitable, profitable for them is up in the air. Um, some other services that use online video but aren't um, Directly what we are are some video, virtual video conferencing services. And we're not a video conferencing service. Um, we weren't, we didn't build ourselves to try to be one. But those services do use online video and we get the question a lot to how are you different than WebEx? How are you different than Skype? Um, those services do what they do very well. Um, for example, if they're WebEx, go to meeting and Skype. Um, HP recently, uh, I think just last week, launched a service called Skyrim. 
then it combines better quality video, um, similar to Skype, um, with some of the features, desktop sharing features, uh, that go to meeting yes. But these companies, their focus is on desktop sharing, and the video is secondary. There's a limit on video quality for these services, and on the number of participants that can view the video simultaneously. So I was, I was making some slides here to show you how these the uh, free companies have evolved into their paid services. It's taken them to the launch two paid services. Uh, one is called Paper Live, Paper Live, and one is called Stream API. They both charge money in different ways. Um, Paper, Paper Live will let you broadcast events um, for a fee using their service, and they will let you, as the broadcaster, charge people to view your events. So people can have a virtual ticket to your event. Um, that's also a feature that we have in, in development that will be launched soon. So you'll be paying, yes, you'll be paying for our service, but you can make that money back and make additional revenue by charging for your content. That's something you'd like to do. Okay, so now you're going to see a slide that's not supposed to be there. Okay, so now I'd like to do two things. I'd like to try to switch the computer over to a <coughs> so you can see our site and I can walk you through some of the features that our Vivo uh, service offers. And then I also want to move this one into a discussion and um, find out some applications that any of you are using online video for, applications you might be interested in using it for, and you know, just brainstorm on ideas because you know I gave you the the uses for our service that, that we've thought of, but there's all these new ones that we would never think of. So I'm sure some of you may be um, doing some interesting applications in other areas of blogging or podcasting. Um, that might benefit from that video. So we're always very interested to hear, particularly from people um, familiar with the other technology services out there, how they might use live video. And also, what additional features next to the live video might make it more useful. So I mentioned some of ours with our interactivity with our chat and our Q&A feature. Um, things we're in development right now are um, ways for you to sell products all within your video page, or some e-commerce abilities. But we're also working on um, I mentioned one of our cornerstones is not to have obtrusive ads pushed to your viewers. But one thing we do want to offer is the ability, if you have some partners, some advertising partners of your own, and they've given you ads, um, we're developing a simple interface for you to be able to show those ads that you have control over um, within your Vivo page. So just like we're working on a suite of tools to help you make money um, with your content with live video if you choose to do so, if that's something that makes sense for uh, for your application. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start switching over to the demo. But, um, just go at it. Is anyone using live video? Or can we talk about what you're doing? I'm using live video actually in three different <laughs> portions of my life. I do it on my podcasts, um, audio podcasts, and I'm starting to stream video with that at the same time for some reason people want to watch me. <laughs> um, but my nine to five job, I teach. Um, broadcast communications in one of the regional high, one of the high schools in the region. Oh, great. And we have been using news training to stream morning announcements and afternoon announcements so family members can watch them at home because mom and dad keep saying they're not getting the information through the kids. And then on Friday nights, we're streaming um, the football broadcast that we do for local cable channel using live stream. Right. So we're able we're able to do that and we've gotten a positive response to that. Not only that, we're having more people watch us from other districts than our own because they can't make it to the game. So are you paying for, for the live stream service? No, it's we're doing we're doing the free service right now, trying to uh, trying to get a, a fan base up. And I was just wondering with what you're offering here, are you looking into educational components? Yeah, or absolutely. Where you can do it because with the way um, mainstream media is right now, this is a great alternative to be able to get the information out there and have the kids actually produce it themselves. Sure. What was your name? Um, mine's Bill Alexander. Bill, okay. Thanks for the, the question, Bill. Actually, education is, is one of our key focuses on the consumer. And so whether it's sports games, um, morning announcements, um, so many people in the educational sector from a company less than saying that the, the content is pushed to you when you're on the free sites, Ustream or live stream. You know, you never know what's going to pop up in the related content section or the advertising. Yeah. 
Ustream is a little bit more um, touchy. However, Livestream, they've been working with some ad companies and they're actually selling um, like mainstream products and they're running TV commercials for 30 seconds before they get to our feed, mm -hmm. which I don't find objectionable. What I find objectionable is what Ustream's doing is when you're doing a morning out and you have a beer ad up on the bottom of the screen. Oh, yeah. That's not really appropriate. Mm -hmm. That is, yeah, we've had, I mean, I think they are they are aware of that and they are trying to position the ads so they're not yeah. objectionable, but it does happen. You know, we, just, we have a, a folder full of screenshots of examples of that kind of stuff that we show sometimes. But, um, you know, we're working, we're looking to develop relationships with people in media departments and schools directly to see what makes sense for them. Um, you know, and when you when get into the site, you'll see this. But in addition to our video, when it's the video, the broadcasting and viewing is the core. But these value-added widgets that offer other services, other content next to the video, um, we're very focused on developing those for the various industries that we're targeting. So schools, um, you know, maybe they they want a content box next to the video that lists the morning announcements. Maybe they have links to an internal internet site that you know is specific to their school. But when right now. With each industry, we develop or we identify those needs and develop um, components on our site specifically to fit that. And none of the other um, players are doing that. They're kind of doing a one-size-fits-all. You know, sign up for our service and make use of our general tools. So that's one of the ways we're trying to differentiate ourselves. You said that the uh, Chris tried to keep inside the door. Came back because. Uh, Right, so the cost itself is not expensive. The, the reason it's expensive for them is because they have an existing customer base of millions of people who are their free users who aren't paying any money to use the service. The collective cost of, of what it their cost for all of those people to be broadcasting every day is what makes it expensive for them. Uh, the archival videos? Yeah, when you have when you have so many of them together, yes. Not to make money, although YouTube or sorry, YouTube, um, the the things they've introduced in the past year, they've made some partnerships with record companies. They're not getting sued anymore because they, if you notice, when you play our uh, video track, they'll cut the audio out if it's a copyrighted track. They are doing things on that end where they say they're approaching profitability, but who knows? For real, I mean, it's, it's Google. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, if any of you are interested in seeing a demo of the site, uh, if you go to vivolive.com, if you want to grab one of my cards, um, I'd be more than willing to uh, run and run through a demo if you'd like to see how our service could apply specifically to uh, your needs. We didn't have time to get into it up here. I'll take one of your cards. Sure. Hi. Hi. It's nice to meet you. I'm Dave. Yeah, Dave. I worked for a company that's actually uh, headquartered in Warrenville, okay. doing lighting machinery. Um, that's something we wanted to really look at more. Yeah, I didn't have a chance to get into it, but corporate training or, or you know, remote um, remote analysis of equipment, site equipment, right. is something we've been working at, so I'd love to talk to you about that. Okay, good. Thank you. Nice to meet you, there. Yeah, I'd like a card, too. I'm sure. Yeah, it's hilarious. So, yeah. I'm a teacher, and our school is looking into just do the same thing. Oh, great, great, great. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, three American classes. Okay, okay, in touch. Thank you. It's nice to meet you. Yeah, no, we do. I didn't get a chance to do the Excel and the mice. They let you use any traditional camcorder. It's a hardware device. Normally, that's not possible. But uh, I can give you more information. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really good thing. Thank you. 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 Thank 
Okay. Let me give you a little bit of credit. Yeah, a little interesting. Thank you.